I'm the lead organizer for the Release Aging People in Prison, or the RAP campaign. The uh, overall goals of RAP are to play a role in reducing mass incarceration in the United States. A way that we uh, decided to intersect in that issue is to focus on the elderly in prison. I'm a project associate at the Correctional Association of New York. Well, prison, prison is not really, as far as the physical structure, it's not built to house elderly people. You know, there's no uh, handicap ramps, there's no access, there's no um, showers for the elderly, you know, there's no elevator, you know, you have to take stairs, you have to walk. So it's, it's, it's really a, a detriment to them as they get older, when they get these injuries and infirmities, they can't really move to and fro in the facility. The biggest challenge we face is that uh, so-called divide between the violent and the nonviolent offenders because the population we focused on uh, by nature uh, because they're serving uh, incredibly long sentences have been convicted of violent offenses. Uh, I was convicted uh, of uh, attempt murder of a police officer. I was sentenced to 15 years to life and at that 15-year mark, I had made major achievements behind the prison wall. When I was arrested, I was pretty much uneducated. I didn't even have a, a, a high school diploma. And, and by, at that 15-year mark, I had uh, four college degrees, two of them uh, graduate degrees. And I was denied parole, and I was denied parole again and again every two years for the next 18 years. And so instead of that 15 years, I wound up serving uh, 33 years before I was released. Yeah, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn. Uh, went to the educational system in Bed-Stuy. Lived in Brevard projects up until I was like 11. Moved to Brownsville. And around 14, I moved to Flatbush. By 1979, I was 19. And I participated in a robbery that eventually became a murder. My behavior and participation in that caused me to get 20 to life. I did 26 years and 11 months. So between the age of 19 to the age of 45, I was inside New York State prison system. I just, this is common. This is not an anomaly what happened in my case. And that's pretty much what helped me uh, deal with the situation that I realized it wasn't personal, that I understood there was a policy, broad policy going on. After about eight months of strategy, we came up with the rap platform. Mohammed Kote, and he was in his mid to late 80s, still repeatedly being denied by the parole board in New York with the claim that he was gonna risk the public safety. And we uh, pretty much pushed this case in the media. New York eventually released him, and they insisted that he, uh, before they would release him, we had to find a healthcare facility that would take him on. ...of social workers, uh, something that uh, Tanya and uh, Dave plugged into. Okay. We uh, put together what's called an aging reentry task force, but we uh, tried to bring together most of the uh, reentry organizations that had the resources to provide uh, services for this particular population when they come home. There was a man there 43 years, came home a few months ago, and he had no place, he had no family. Uh, we had to make calls to get him into a three-quarter house. Uh, eventually we got him into a three-quarter house and then the, we found some part-time work for him so that he could get employment. The most uh, recent issue that I've seen that affect elderly people behind the walls uh, is someone that I know has contacted us because they're having a problem retiring and they are over 70 years old, and the system refuses to allow them to retire. They had a, a pretty plush job for about the last 12 years in the library. Uh, they decided that no person confined behind the walls can stay in the same job for more than a year. He filed a grievance, and uh, the grievance was denied, and he was put into a position as a janitor. The meetings on the first Wednesday of the month are what we call coalition meetings. 
And so those are the meetings where everybody is invited, the general public, and uh, different organizations and representatives to uh, give input. I think we're going to see something like a tale of two cities. Uh, we're going to see things maybe progressing on the state level, on the local level, and we're going to see things getting worse on the federal level. But we've been making so much progress that I don't see this being turned back. Uh, people are coming together more. People are understanding the vital need to work in coalition. And uh, we have even seen that with uh, the people who have uh, historically been the most disempowered, you know, the formerly incarcerated. In this day and time, we have the ears of important people listening. I remember when I was inside, that was one of the biggest prayers and wishes, that we wish someone would come in here and see what's going on. We would wish someone to listen to us to hear about our concerns. We have that opportunity now. You know, we have major reporters, major newspapers, major politicians willing to learn and willing to engage on these issues. So that's why it's important for the community to come out now, because their voices will be heard.